Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Man Who Bought Death. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Love makes the world go around, so they say, but it also causes a lot of trouble. Take, for instance, the case of Eddie Ford and Ruth Sprague. They were in love, had been for a long time, childhood sweethearts and all. The kind of thing that usually brings nothing but happiness and good fortune. But Eddie and Ruthie were born on the wrong side of town. They grew up on Second Avenue, and that's not exactly the best environment. Eddie's love for Ruth began to show itself in the wrong way. At seven, he stole an apple for her. At 14, he stole a car to take her for a ride. At 17, he'd spent his first night in jail. And at 22, he is firmly established as a small-time crook about town. But he and Ruthie are still in love, just waiting for him to knock over a big enough score to get married. Meanwhile, Ruth works as a dancer in a cheap nightclub. And sometimes Eddie goes over and sits at a table with her between floor shows. With you tonight, Eddie. Oh, I'm sick of being broke. Well, why don't you get a job? What do you think I am, a jerk? Working for 20 bucks a week? I don't know how to do anything. Yeah, I know it, Eddie. I know how I could have plenty of dough, though, if I could get some operating cash. Yeah, well, how much? All I need is a C-note. <laughs> Might as well be a million. Of course, if I had a hundred dollars, I'd give it to you. You know that. Yeah, I know. Hey, Eddie. I thought I told you to stay out of here. You told me. What do you think you are, a cop, Pete? Go on. I don't want you in the place. You're a cheap grafter, and I don't want you hanging around the girls. Uh, oh, Eddie's all right, Pete. Look, if he don't stay out of here, I'm going to fire you too, Ruthie. Oh. All right, Eddie, take distance. I got a job for Ruthie. Yeah, what kind of a job? The kind of job I pay you for, baby. No. There's a guy over there who's throwing money around like confetti, and he wants to meet you. Oh, oh, that big moose with the brown suit, I suppose. Yeah, that's him. He's smiling at you, Ruthie. <laughs> Is that what you call it? Hey, maybe you better go over to his table, sugar. Yeah. Maybe Eddie needs some dough. Shove off, Pete. Where are you looking? I'll be right over. Okay. Now, there's nothing personal unless you understand, Eddie. Just don't want you in here, that's all. Mm. I'll see you backstage after the show, huh, Ruthie? Mm-hmm. All right, Eddie. Eddie. Huh? You love me a little? Huh? Oh, you know I do, <laughs> honey. And if this guy's loaded, I want him. You understand? Okay, Eddie. Well, I'll see you after the show, huh? Okay. <laughs> Yes, Eddie and Ruth are in love, but business is business. So Ruthie goes to join the big moose in the brown suit. She walked up to his table, smiled prettily, and said, Hello. Well, hello, baby. Sit down and build yourself a laugh. Thanks. You're, uh, you're on the top tonight, aren't you? Yeah, and uh, you're going to join me, young stuff. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting way to spend the evening. You know, um... That bottle looks like champagne. <laughs> that's funny. That's just what it is. <laughs> and I bought it for you, oh. lovely. Nothing's too good for Frankie Ferrari's girlfriend. You're in the big league now, sweetheart. You talk a great game. <laughs> Stick around and watch me play it, baby. I just hit town tonight, and I'm fat with that stuff. Want to help me spend it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, uh... I got a lot of talent that way. Well, <laughs> what are you doing after the show tonight? Hey, nothing. Well, that is... Nothing that you're not going to be in on. You're a lippy little dame, aren't you? I like them, Lippy. 
I think you and I are going to get along, baby. Keep the next couple of weeks open. You're going to be busy. <laughs> well, uh, look, let's talk about that later, huh? Because I uh, got to get backstage. Brochure goes on a few minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll meet you out in front five minutes after the show's over, okay? Five minutes? <laughs> you must dress like a fireman. Well, I don't waste time uh, at anything, Frankie. <laughs> So that's the way love works on 2nd Avenue. Ruth steers the big bankroll Eddie's way. Well, that's one way of filling a hope chest. After the show, Eddie's waiting backstage to give her the proper instructions. Now look, at this 12 o'clock closing, this guy's going to be looking for a speak when he meets you. See? Now you steer him down 12th Street. And you pass the alley between Washington and Adams, I'll let him have my persuader behind his ear and you run. You bring back the first cop you can find. That'll keep you in the clear. And I'll have the dough and be gone a long time before the gendarmes get there. Yeah, okay, Eddie, I'll do it. <laughs> Gee, maybe this will be our big break. Okay, okay. Down 12th Street, you're leading him to a speak, see? Eh? Well, this looks like it might be very interesting, doesn't it, Eddie? You scurry out the back door of the nightclub while Ruthie makes a quick change and meets the amorous Frankie out in front of the club. Well, uh, where do we go from here, Curly Lark? What do you feel in the mood for? Oh, I feel in the mood for fun. And it's been 12 o'clock closing, silly. Oh, that's for the squares, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, don't you know any joints that stay open? Oh, yeah. I, well, I know one, but it's pretty expensive. Oh, dough don't mean anything, baby. Where is this joint? It's over on 12th Avenue. Uh, shall we get a cab? No, it's only about a... Oh, about two and a half blocks. All right, so we'll walk. Oh, I love to be out, walking around at this time of night. Not this time of year. Ain't the fresh air just wonderful? I don't know. I never noticed it. Oh, you wouldn't notice it if you had to work in a gin mill like I do. Hey, uh, what's a beautiful dame like you doing dancing in a flea bag like the Club Modern? Mm. Haven't you ever had a better offer? Want to make me one? Could be if... Uh... Things work out. Oh, this is 12th Street. We turn down here. What's the matter, kid? Don't you like me? Oh, sure I like you. I love big men with money. <laughs> Looks like I'm made to order chicken. I weigh 260 and I make all the money I want. No limit. Yeah, well, how do you do it? Oh, I'm an operator. And that's all the conversation we're going to have on that subject. Hey, this is a nice dark street. How about a kiss? Oh, no, not here. I... Well, uh, the speed's only a block away. Can't you wait till we get there? <laughs> okay, baby. I like my dames with spirit. Up to a point. Stick around. You know, Frankie, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you turned out to be the kind of man that I could learn to love. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, listen, baby. Oh, uh, uh, Eddie. Run, will you? Give me a couple of seconds, then yell for the cops. Yeah, well, Eddie, is he dead? Beat it, beat it. Go on. <laughs> What do those signs mean? Ring around the moon, they say, means rain tomorrow. Rosy sunset said to forecast a fair morning. And that big black circle sign with the yellow letter spelling signal gasoline, well, there's the sign that never fails to mean most miles from your gas coupon. Yes, more and more wise western drivers are daily discovering that it's not just a slogan, it's a fact. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And for good reason. One, true to its 14-year tradition of quality, Signal Oil Company is still producing the very finest signal gasoline that can be marketed today. And two, the famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. So if you haven't tried signal gasoline in your car, may I suggest there never was a better time nor a better reason for looking up the station in your neighborhood displaying Signal's yellow and black circle signs and getting acquainted with your signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler.
Yes, love on 2nd Avenue can lead to all sorts of things, like the slugging of a big spender in a dark alley. And Ruth carries out her part of the bargain like an old hand at crime. She runs screaming from the scene and brings the cops down in a hurry. It happened right here. Oh, there's nobody here now. What's the matter with you? You've been drinking? No. I tell you, I was walking along here with a man. What was his name? His name was Frank, or old Frank something or other. I can't remember his last name. Uh, you better change your brand, lady. You're having hallucinations. Somebody in the alley, they must have lost their marbles. Oh, yeah? I ought to take you down to the station. But I ain't done anything. Okay, okay, get out of here. Go on home and don't be bothering policemen. Uh, take it away, Jerry. This is a false alarm. That's funny, Ruth. You know that Eddie sapped Frank Ferrari to the sidewalk just a few minutes ago. And now, there's no sign of either Eddie or Ferrari. That's very funny. You can't see the humor in the situation, though. And you hurry to Nick's all-night restaurant to keep your rendezvous with Eddie. He's there in a rear booth waiting for me. Hello, baby. Hello, Eddie. Hey, look, the funniest thing well, happened. Keep it down I... to a college cheer, will you, baby? Yeah. Sit down. Eddie, I, I, I waited to give you a chance to get away, you know, before I started to scream for the police. By the time I got back with the police, well, it couldn't have been over just three or four minutes. Well, there was nobody there. You're nuts. That guy was as cold as a witch's foot. Well, he wasn't there, Eddie. Police thought I was crazy. Gosh, I must be losing my touch. Well, the guy must have come to and beat it. Oh, probably just didn't want to get mixed up with the newspapers or yeah, something. Yes, sir. I thought you said he had a lot of dough on him. What? Well, he did, Eddie. I, I saw it. Well, oh, nothing but chicken feed. Well, there it is. Seventy-eight bucks, three twenties, a ten, five, and three singles. You're lying to me, Eddie. Oh, me? Why would I lie to you? I shook him down. That's all the dough he had. Petty, larceny, punk. Now, take it easy there, baby. I, look, I, I know he had a hundred dollar bill, because he showed it to me. There wasn't a C-note on him when I got him. That's true, Eddie. You understand? So what's the matter with you, baby? I I don't mind you robbing anybody else. And I never beat when you spent every cent that I could make. But I won't stand for you lying to me, Eddie. No dame talks to me like that. <gasps> oh, Eddie. Keep the hundred dollar bill. It'll never do you any good. It'll do nothing but get you into trouble, and I hope it kills you. So, after all of these years, the love affair between Eddie Ford and Ruthie Sprague hit the rocks. And just because Eddie stole a hundred dollars, he did steal it, you know. Frank Ferrari was carrying a hundred. And $78 when Eddie knocked him unconscious and robbed him in that alley between Washington and Adams. Eddie hated to lose Ruth, but business is business. Next day, he called on Bill Larimer at Bill's house in the suburbs. Eddie'd always wanted to do business with Larimer. You see, Larimer was a wholesaler in counterfeit money. Wholesalers sell it for 20 cents on the dollar to the shovers. Those are the people who actually cash it. Eddie had always wanted to be a big-time shover. He'd had a little experience, and he knew all the dodges. So this morning, he walks into Bill Larimer's apartment. I want to buy $500 worth of ten. Yeah? What are you going to use for money? This fee note? Hundred dollar bill, huh? Yeah. Where'd you get it? Go on, look it over. It was made by the mint. Yeah. It's good, all right. You know, there's something about a hundred dollar bill... They feel different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I like them. You could square a lot of beasts if you got enough of them. You're not kidding. Hey, George. Yeah? How'd you like to print up some hundreds for me? One, ten, twenty, hundred. Don't make no difference to me. Come here. Yeah, take a look at this C-note. Did you make a good plate on it? Yeah. Yeah, that'd photograph okay. I could swing it. Gee, wouldn't it be a little tough, shoving hundreds? With all the dough that is floating around these days? <laughs> That'd be duck soup. You push a couple of those a day, Eddie, you'd be in the dough. Yeah. Well, how about it? You gonna make some up? What do you say, Judge? Will you buy them? I'll take a thousand dollars worth the day they're finished. Okay, Bill. You just placed an order. 
Well, uh, give me those fifty tens. I got to go get rid of them so I can buy some of those hundreds. Better not try to shove hundreds in that suit. Huh? You got to get a front to get away with that, Eddie. Take some of the dough you make off those tens and buy yourself a front. You're going to be in the dough, kid. So Eddie took a little trip out of town and spread his phony $10 bill. In railway stations, department stores, restaurants, and grocery stores, and was never questioned. He was gone about 10 days. When he came back, he thought of calling Ruthie, but decided he'd better call Bill first. He was pretty excited when Bill told him the hundreds were ready. He went right out there. Bill was glad to see him. He showed him the hundred dollar bills, and they were beauties. That George was a craftsman, Bill said. There they are, ready. They're perfect. The best job George ever did. Yeah. See, they're beauties, all right. Think you can pass them? I wouldn't be afraid to pass those at the Federal Reserve Bank. Look, here's the hundred you brought in. I'm going to mix it up with the rest of these. Now, see if you can pick it up. Gosh. Gosh, I can't tell. Which one is it? I could hardly tell myself if I wasn't an expert on it. Hey, you've been selling these C-notes to everybody as the town flooded with them? I haven't sold a patch of them, even. Just got them from George today. You got virgin territory, son. Well, that's good. Okay, here's a hundred bucks. Give me five of them. Five? Is that all I tell you, Gus? No. I'm not going to sell you a hundred bucks worth. Give me two hundred. Well, okay, here you are. Now you're stuck in business. Well, you think I can pass C-notes in this outfit? Hmm. Yeah, you look like a gentleman. You saved some dough for this, sir, didn't you? Eighty-five bucks. Counterfeit money. Where are you stopping? Oh, I'm stopping at the Towers, best hotel in town. Oh, boy, you ought to see my luggage. Cowhide. Real cowhide. Yeah? Now you're operating, Eddie. Let me give you one tip. Uh, you can probably get away with spreading a couple of these centuries here in town. You probably won't be caught up with. But then they're going to start watching. So you better get out of town. Oh, don't you worry. In the first place, I'm not going to get nabbed. And in the second, if I do... I'm not going to talk. If you do, you'll be saying your last word, Teddy. Yes, Eddie, be careful. Now you're in it for keeps. In the big time. A real big shot. So now you decide to call Ruth. You find her at home, too. And you make a date to meet her at the Towers in the cocktail lounge. You want her to see your new clothes. Want to impress her with the fact that you're living at the best hotel in town. Plenty of money. You can't be blamed for wanting to gloat a little, can you? So, Ruthie meets you, and you sip and sip your drink. Well, honey, how about letting bygones be bygones, and let's start all over again, huh? Yeah, but that was a dirty trick, though, now, wasn't it? You stole that hundred dollars from me. Oh, but you framed the thing so I could get the dough to start operating, didn't you? Yeah, um, I'd have given you the money, Eddie, but, well, I, I just don't like the idea of you lying to me. That's what I was mad about. Did you say was mad? You're not mad anymore? No. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not mad, Eddie. I, yeah, I, I could never be mad at you. Hey, hmm? you want to see something pretty? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Take a gander at this. Well, it's a hundred dollar bill, That's right. I'm lousy with them, baby. You know where I got them? No. Well, what you don't know won't hurt you, baby. Uh, look, I, I know you got to go to rehearsal, but how about me coming up to your place about uh, 5 o'clock? Oh, it's well. Why don't you take the night off? Oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy some presents for you, oh. and I want you to be there when I bring them. Okay, Eddie. I'll be home at 5. But look, i I, I got to go now. Okay. How about a kiss? Uh, here? In front of all these people? Well, sure. You're uptown now, baby. You can get away with things here that they'd never stand for down where we live. We're in a big time now, honey. For good. Don't be so sure of yourself, Eddie. In your racket, that's not good. Take it easy. But you can't get over being a big shot, can you? You can't resist going to a swank department store to buy your girl a real present. Uh, thank you, miss. Yes, may I help you? Yes, yes. I uh, want to buy a lapel pin for my girlfriend. I, I don't know much about things like that. Would you mind helping me out? Well, of course, I'd be glad to. Oh. Do you see anything in this tray that you think she might like? Well, she's a blonde, about five feet one, blue eyes, and wears black most of the time. Oh, well, let me see. I think she'd probably like a lapel pin. Oh, 
probably like this guinea a very much. Oh, that one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How much is that? Well, it was just a minute. It's $35. I have to add the luxury tax to this. Oh, that, that would be about $42. Yes. Oh, that's okay. Uh, can you take it out of this? Oh, my, a hundred dollar bill. Oh, I'm sorry, it's all I have. Oh, well, of course, that's perfectly all right. I'll have the change for you in a moment. Yes, Eddie, wait for your change. You stand there smoking your cigarette. And after a few minutes, you begin to worry, don't you? You try not to show it, but you sense that something's wrong. Then you look around and see him. The man with the unmistakable aura of a store detective. He comes up the aisle and stops a few paces from him. Something's wrong, Eddie. But they never arrest a man for shoving queer dough. They follow him try to find out where his source is. You've only got one of the bills on you, Eddie. You can say you won it in in a crap game. They can't prove anything. But then you turn and see them, two uniformed policemen coming down the aisle. And suddenly you're not so sure. You're not calm now, Eddie. You're scared, panicky. You've got to get out. Run. Run, Eddie, run. You got away all right, Eddie, but you've got a bullet hole in your shoulder. You switch cabs five times and cover your trail, but your handkerchief won't stop up the blood that's pouring from your shoulder. You've got to get attention, and Ruth is waiting for you. You finally get to her little flat. You get out of the cab a block away from it and wait until the cab pulls away before you start walking. You're tired when you get there, weak from loss of blood. Yeah. Now, let me in. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, what's happened to you? I don't know. Oh. I think the cops in this town have gone crazy. Oh, honey, you've been shot. Yeah. Yeah, they got me through the shoulder. Well, what are you going to do, Eddie? Well, I'm going to stay here till he dies down. Well, come on in the bed, honey. you got to lie down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't feel so good. Now, let me take a look at that wound. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Let me lay down, will you? Oh, baby, baby, how did it happen? I tell you, the cops are going nuts. Oh, here, honey, let me put this pillow on each uh, shoulder. Here. Yeah. I think the best thing to do with a baby is just to lay still so it stops bleeding. What happened, Eddie? Well, this morning when I got to town, I bought some phony $100 bills. Counterfeits, you know. <laughs> Shoving queer money? I don't go pure on you. Of course I've been well, shoving queer money. What do you think? Robbed a bank? Well, then why did they shoot you? I don't know. I don't get it. Even if they knew the bill was queer, they wouldn't send for the riot squad and start shooting up the department store. Oh, don't you think we ought to call a doctor? Oh, sure, yeah. That'd be a brainy move. But, Who's that? Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't expecting I better get in that closet and hide. Yeah, Whoever it is, get rid yeah, of them now, will yeah, you? Yeah, I will, of course. Your name is Ruth Sprague? Yeah. Looking for a friend of yours, a guy by the name of Eddie Forbes. Know where he is? Well, no. No, I, I ain't seen him. Well, we'll just come in and take a look around. Well, no, but you can't come in here because... Oh, no. Oh. All right, boys, take the joint down. But... Ah, what's the matter, Sprague? Cut your finger? Huh? What's oh, that no. blood doing on the floor? Hey, guy stood there for a while and went through that door over there. Mm-hmm. Think... Nice of him to leave a trail like that. Get your guns out, boys. This guy's hotter than a four-alarm fire. Now, you stay out of the way, Miss Sprague. There's liable to be some fireworks. We're going in after that guy. We're coming in after you, Ford. When I kick this door in, be standing there with your hands up or we start blasting. Come and get me. Oh, no, I didn't know. Come on, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. Kick that gun out of his hand, Jordan. <laughs> Cold meat, Sergeant. Hey. Eddie. He's trying to say something. <laughs> Uh, you haven't got long to live, Ford. If you want to say anything, spit it out. Oh, what's the matter with you, cop? You crazy? Shooting a guy for hat and queer dough. What are you talking about? Oh, oh no, no. He's gone, Judge. Guy must have been nuts. What was he talking about, queer dough? Oh, that's what you were after him for, wasn't it? Passing counterfeit money. No. Where'd you ever get that idea? 
We had this guy bracketed for that quarter million dollar bank robbery in Capital City a couple of weeks ago. He even tried to spend some of the money today. That's how we got on his tail. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's a $64 question that every driver should have a ready answer for these days. If one of your tires should suddenly be ruined, what would you tires are still hard, mighty hard to find? Which makes now, before you have tire trouble, the time to take advantage of your signal dealer's complete tire service. By catching and repairing small injuries before they spread and ruin the carcass, and by suggesting retreading before the tread is worn too thin, your signal dealer can add thousands of miles of tire wear. And because of your signal dealer's experience, Plus, modern equipment and the best of materials, you're assured the quality kind of job that can make such a big difference in tire life. So make it a point soon to stop at one of those friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle signs, and have your tires inspected. There's no one who can give you finer or more complete tire service than your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Eddie Forbes died for his crime. But the police were after him not for passing counterfeit money, the crime for which he was guilty. No, they cornered him for a crime he didn't commit, a crime he didn't even know had been committed. Remember how Eddie got that $100 bill from the heavy spender Ruthie steered his way? The counterfeiters made an engraving of that same bill, printed a few hundred of them, and sold some back to Eddie. But every cashier in the country was watching for the serial number on that bill and on all the counterfeits made from it. The heavy spender had picked it up illegitimately from a bank in Capital City. And Eddie died because he didn't know that. Ruth, her wish came true. Remember when she was sore at Eddie for lying to her? She made the wish that that hundred dollar bill he held out on her would cause his death. Yes, wishes do come true sometimes. And love ends up in funny ways. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Ray Buffum, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.